Ovajana, Tumiran Tasya, Yanam Jana Shalakaya, Chakshur Militam Yena Tasma Shigurvena Maha. So Hare Krishna to all the dear devotees. You got here at the same time as us. A chintya shakti. How that old car can go at that speed. So I'm just going to speak because we don't have much time. I have a habit when I start talking, I just go on and on. So I just speak after offering my obeisances to the Supreme Lord and his devotees. Om Jnana Timirandhasya Jnanam Jana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Sthapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadama Hyam Dadati Sukhidanti Kam Andeham Shri Guru Shri Atapadakamadam Shri Guru Navaishnavams Cha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahadana Raghunatam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sabadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padam Sahadana Lalita Shri Vishwakam Vitam Sajivam He Krishna Karuna Sindho Dinarandho Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tapta Kanjana Gorangi Radhe Vrinda Vaneshwari Rishadhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Namcha Tauta Tarugas Chakri Vasim Hubi Avichar Patitanam Bhavane Pyo Vaishnava Pyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Vrita Gadadhara Shri Vasandhi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. We pray for the mercy of the Vaishnavas that they will always kindly pour the nectar of these holy names into our ears and nourish the barren desert of our heart with the life-giving nectar of Krishna Consciousness. Just, uh, we drove now from Lika and I was feeling somewhat sleepy and weak on the way, but on arriving here, hearing this sweet kirtan, I felt so much enlivened and remembered Prabhupada's wonderful statement, of course Prabhupada made so many wonderful statements, but one particular wonderful statement in this regard about kirtan. Prabhupada was talking about kirtan as the alternative to obstreperous, no, that means it means stubborn and defiant uh, revolutions. And and Prabhupada said that instead of meetings, revolutions, Resolution, resolution, no, meetings, revolutions, resolutions, dissolution, and no solution, better to, is to have kirtan. I was just remembering that quote of Prabhupada. And I came into the hall and saw something which I haven't seen for many years because I'm not living in this part of the world or this culture. I don't even know what it's called in, in, in English. What do you call it? It's a, a, a big tap for draft beer. They have out here on the, at the front. You pull this and the beer comes out of the tap. Yeah, you must know. Marari Gupta is looking bewildered. He's, a, he's living a pure life in the village there. Of course, they have in the villages also, but he doesn't go to the bars. So it is such a stark contrast that inside the hall the devotees are very joyfully chanting the beautiful names of Krishna and at the entrance is this reminder. It's, it's like a symbol of the Western culture. And I was, I was just considering how much deeply that is part of the Western way of life all over Europe. I was just discussing with 
Kishor Prabhu here, who's from Slovenia, he was saying that Slovenians are some of the biggest drinkers in Europe. And I thought, well, everyone, everyone thinks that. The, the Poles think that we're the biggest drinkers, and the, the, the English think we're the biggest drinkers, and the Irish think we're the biggest drinkers. And, I mean, everyone's just drunk most of the time. And that they take pride that we, we consume more alcohol, we have bigger molecules than others. It's so much part of the culture, whether it's, it's I was saying to Rupa Prabhu, it's probably more wine here. He said, no, no, we have beer also. <laughs> Why only wine? <laughs> and in uh, Russia and Poland, it's more like vodka. And of course, they also have beer and wine and everything, all varieties. So, so I didn't really come here to discuss various methods of getting drunk. But it's just a, such a symbol of the Western way of life, so much part of the culture that if you if you do something, if something joyful happens, you you pass an exam or your football team wins, or then you 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 drink to celebrate it. And New Year, you drink to celebrate it. And any other times, you just drink anyway. So, and uh, Kishore was also telling me that he, because he's forced by the laws of his government to do some civil army, what's that, civil service or, you know, alternative for going to the army. You have it in Croatia also, I know, because so many of my Ramachari disciples are victimized by this. So they have their get-togethers and then the, the that's part of it. Pour out a bottle of wine. It's so much part of the Western way of life. So I was thinking how Prabhupada he is so much concerned to bring the Krishna conscious way of life, a different culture. That's, of course, drinking is there in India also. Generally, that used to be among the, and still is, mostly among the lower class people, and that's considered very, very low class to drink any kind of alcohol in India. In, in, in the Western countries, it's, uh, drinking beer is considered ordinary, and drinking wine, especially there is some kind of champagne that is considered high class, or some expensive brandy or whiskey that's considered more high class. But actually, in, uh, it's all low class. In Indian culture, it's considered very, anyone who's drinking, it's considered very low class. You see, in, in the past times of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that Sriras Thakur, who's a great devotee of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, some people wanted to defame him. So they put outside his house the paraphernalia for worshipping Chandi, which means Durga including which is a pot of wine. So they wanted to represent as if, as if he was using all these paraphernalia of this uh, Pantha or left wing, that's the literal translation, it's, or the, the, uh, the low-class tantric worship of Durga, which uh, involves wine drinking, meat eating, illicit sex, all these things. So that, that was considered, that, that, that was an effort to put a stain on his character. That someone is drinking. Oh, how horrible, how low class. So that's a different culture. That, that culture that Prabhupada introduced to some extent, the Krishna conscious way of life, that is a, a culture based on different values. The value of life is how one can become spiritually elevated. So in Vedic culture, one is considered advanced, not according to the amount of drink he can drink. That's, that's also considered in the Western culture. If you, can, if you can drink a whole bottle of wine and still stand on two feet, that's considered, yeah, he's a real man. But there are different uh, prestige symbols or status symbols in, uh, in the Vedic culture. Of course, as Krishna states in Bhagavad Gita, Amanitvam 
Adamdipna, the symbol of a person who is in knowledge is that he doesn't require prestige, he doesn't act for prestige. But nevertheless, one is considered advanced if he is renounced, eats little, sleeps little, is learned in Vedic literature, uh, refrains from any form of sense gratification. So this is, uh, and is engaged in spiritual practices. The Brahmanas, they are considered the most prestigious. The kings, the Kshatriyas, they also have their prestige, which, yeah, who's got the biggest army, who's got the biggest kingdom, who's the most powerful personally. Not simply by political maneuvers he takes leadership, but he's physically, personally very powerful and very skillful in fighting, yes. There is Rati, Maharati, Atirati, the, the different grades of fighters who can fight with, they can single-handedly fight some of them with a thousand other chariot drivers, single-handedly. And so that's a great skill, great feat. So they have their prestige, but they will bow down to the Brahmanas, who don't have any physical prowess. But they have Brahma Teja, the power of Brahminical, uh, or, or spiritual. Actually, Brahma means spiritual, so they have spiritual power, which surpasses that of any physical power. That's why Vishwamitra, upon seeing who was had the, he was a very powerful Kshatriya, but seeing the spiritual power of Vashishta totally uh, eclipsed him, then he desired to be a Brahman. So in the Vedic culture, the, the completely different set of values, completely different way of life, completely different way of thinking. In the modern Western culture, the emphasis is only on sense gratification. Even previously in this Western world, uh, there was some religious, or there was either not some, there was a very strong uh, religious ethos also, that everyone had to go to church on Sunday. It wasn't optional. You, you had to. There was no question of not going. It was just, it just wasn't considered. Everyone has to go. And all this uh, sex outside marriage, that was, it was not considered. Probably went on some, but it was not socially acceptable. They were very strict control. Even marriage, I was just being told again today that up until recently that was arranged, as in India, that was arranged by the parents, or at least they would have to give their permission. You couldn't marry without their permission. So there are so many controls on gross, licentious life. But nowadays, in the Western countries, the only ethic is enjoy. Enjoy yourself. Have fun. Based on the lowest animal principle of the interaction of the senses with their sense objects, or succinctly, sense gratification. So Prabhupada came to give uh, the highest knowledge and the highest culture. That culture in this is, sometimes we think of culture as art, <coughs> dance, music. These are parts of culture. But they are only expressions of a broader culture, which means the way of life of a people. Culture in, encompasses the values of a people. Why, why do people in the modern age, in, in the Western countries especially, why is their life s simply based on the principle of enjoy? Why? Because the underlying philosophy or, or worldview is atheistic. We have all descended from monkeys, and the monkeys themselves, they developed from amoeba that came into being, they, they, which developed from single-celled organisms, which 
evolved by random interaction of chemicals. So all the way are chemicals, that's all. So this uh, atheistic worldview, which is taught, I don't know how you're going to translate this in Croatian, but it's sarcastically we can say religiously. It is religiously taught in the schools. This world in English, religiously, it means not actually, not necessarily connected with religion, but with the same fervor. That is, if someone, I, I religiously believe, you can, and you can say anything you like, but it means that, yes, or just another thing, gospel, it should be accepted as gospel truths, in other words, unquestionable. So, just like previously, people, they, 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 everyone believed in God. So now everyone believes in this Darwin's theory. And if you try to go against it, there's very strong opposition. People, just like they say that people are sentimentally or fanatically, dogmatically attached to religion. So people are now dogmatically attached to Darwin's theory or the modern evolved versions of Darwin's theory. And if anyone tries to, even from, even with a scientific presentation, if anyone tries to go against that, then the whole academic establishment and the media will come out very strongly against it. Why? They are attached to this understanding because it forms the basis of their way of life, which is animalism, heathenism. Eat, drink, sleep, be merry and enjoy, for tomorrow we shall all be dead. And after death, nothing. That's the wrong idea. So Prabhupada, he saw the defect in modern civilization. The defect is this misunderstanding or total lack of understanding. Or even worse, in modern society, not only is there lack of understanding or misunderstanding of spiritual knowledge, but there is a very strong ethos that one should not even think about these things. There is, there is active propaganda against taking any interest in spiritual philosophy. If anyone starts to be interested in spiritual knowledge, then according to the established culture, he's concerned. So, strange. Something wrong with it. Yeah. Very interesting. Spiritual things. It's a, go to the beach. Lie on the beach. What, what else is there? It's summer. Enjoy. And in the winter, well, there are discos and parties and, you know, there's, there's beer from the Czech Republic. So, you know, what do you, what, what more do you need in life? If society has made so much progress. So we've got all facilities, so you just enjoy yourself, that's all. Why are you interested in all these things? Or even if there is some spiritual life, it, it, uh, it should be bogus. <laughs> then it's kind of acceptable. Some, uh, some kind of transcendental meditation or something. You do some meditation and then you relax and then you get more strength to go back with more enthusiasm for more sense gratification. Oh, you can believe, you see, you know, Christianity, that's very nice. You see, that's a good religion, because, you know, it's, you can be a normal person. You can drink and smoke and eat meat. And, and even though the church says you're not supposed to have divorce, well, you know, God bless the Pope and we'll just do whatever we like anyway. But uh, to be interested, to actually ask the real questions, important questions of life, what is the purpose of life? Where have we come from? Who is God? What is our relationship with God? Why are we suffering? To, to ask these questions and to, to actively pursue the solutions and concomitantly to reject the hedonistic civilization that's considered very strange. Actually it is, it's a revolution. Prabhupada, he wanted to introduce a whole new way of life because he saw that the whole modern civilization is based on a mistake. He, he many times said this, that the whole modern civilization of which people are so proud, it's all based on a mistake, the simple mistake or, 
or the, the overwhelming mistake of considering the body to be the self. Dehatma buddhi, there's a term in Sanskrit. To consider the body as the self. And based on this mistake, everything else they do is a mistake. They got the first proposition wrong, and then after that, everything is wrong. So that is the basic mistake. The proper uh, understanding on which human civilization should be based is Atato Brahma Jignasa. Now that we have attained the human form of life, we should inquire into the Absolute Truth. That should be the goal of all worlds. This is the proper utilization of human life. And therefore, lying on the beach, boozing, enjoying yourself, all these different things, sense gratification in its various innumerable forms, is a misuse of the human form of life, at best a waste of time, and at worst a spoiling of the human energy. Therefore, along with this philosophy of Krishna consciousness and the practice of Krishna consciousness, Prabhupada also wanted to introduce the, the culture of the spiritual world, which is conducive for preparing one's consciousness for entering the spiritual world. The philosophy that Prabhupada taught is that a Bhagavad Gita is to surrender to Krishna. Always think of Krishna. Always think of Krishna, become his devotee, surrender to him, bow down to him. You will go to him. Krishna promises. You will come to me, he says. So that is the philosophy and the practice that is there. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Vishnu, Swanam, Padasevanam, Marjanam, Vandanam, Dasyam, Sakyamanam, Navadha Bhakti, the nine processes of devotional service. And there, there are many other details which have been given in the compilations of the Acharyas. But alongside with this, there is the whole uh, broader culture of Krishna consciousness, which Prabhupada himself, he never considered compromising on. He himself came to the western countries in his regular sannyas dress. And although he said, when people asked, that you can become Prishabharsa in a suit and tie, he said that. And once he was out in Germany, once asked him, that, how can a crocodile of the Nile, I don't know if there are crocodiles in the Nile, anyway, how can a crocodile of the Nile, the river Nile, swim in a German river? And then he, the, the man explained his question, and how can you bring this completely different culture to the Western world? And Prabhupada's answer, Prabhupada was expert in answering briefly and right to the point. Prabhupada said, you can become Krishna conscious in a suit and tie. But on the other hand, Prabhupada himself didn't wear a suit and tie. He said, you can do that. But he himself showed the, or always manifested the Vedic culture, or the culture of the spiritual world. You can chant Hare Krishna in a suit and tie. But, although it's a detail, it's more conducive to where the clothe, the clothing of the spiritual world. It's more conducive to prepare one's identification, or to identify oneself with the spiritual world by dressing, as people do in the spiritual world, by acting, adopting the mannerisms. All this helps to prepare our consciousness for being fully Krishna conscious. Whereas the, the culture of the modern society simply prepares us to go to hell. It's based on gross sense gratification, which is sinful. So everything in the modern society is geared towards sense gratification. So even this point of dress, I, I, I'm just giving it as an example, there are so many facets of culture, dress, 
food, mode of mode of living, and the, the economy and culture. It, it covers the whole gamut of human activities. So this is just an, an example that we can easily understand that that if we dress in the civilian clothing, karmi clothes, then we immediately have some identification with that of others who are dressed like that, whose goal of life is in various forms, eat, sleep, drink, be merry and enjoy for tomorrow we shall all be dead. <laughs> and if we dress as devotees dress, then we I, identify ourselves, immediately our identity is there with those who have different values and different way of life, different goal of life. So, although Krishna consciousness can be adopted to some extent, not fully, it can be adopted to the Western culture, the Vedic culture is more conducive to uh, developing Krishna consciousness. This to some extent, when we say that, that Krishna, one can live a Krishna conscious life, to some extent adopted to the Vedic culture, that only to some extent, not to a very large extent. That this drinking beer, you can't dovetail that in Krishna consciousness. Sometimes in, in the past, devotees used to, devotees, or some kind of devotees used to drink this de-spirited alcohol. That means they make the wine and then they take the alcohol out. And then you drink. Or oh, a oh, decaffeinated coffee. So, you can, you can drink that. I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I'm not sure. Probably very pleased with that. I don't know if you proved that. You can say it's non-alcoholic. Of course, there's got to be some alcohol in there. They can't totally remove it, but... Where is the benefit to your Krishna consciousness? There's no need to do so. So, this adjusting according to time, place and circumstance, sometimes that is misused. This, because Krishna, con Krishna conscious activities can be adjusted to time, place and circumstance. But, in the name of time, place and circumstance, sometimes that allowance is misused. that it's, it's misused as an excuse for some kind of sense gratification. So the, the measuring stick by which we should, or the, the standard by which we should understand is an adjustment acceptable or not? Well, the first thing is, of course, it should be within the four regulated principles. But then the standard by which it should be measured is anu kulyasya sankalpa prati kulyasya vajana. Everything that is favorable for advancing in Krishna Vajra should be accepted and everything that is not should be rejected. That is the standard. So, a devotee can do anything for Krishna if it's actually favorable to his advancement. But, for sense gratification, if the sense gratification is there, then that should not be accepted. Even that to some extent, just like for instance, it may be said that, well, I very much like to eat pizzas. So, that's also, you can make vegetarian pizzas and offers Christian. You can do it. You can do so. But then if we're to think what Krishna likes to eat, and I'll take his prasadam, then we have to offer him what he likes to eat, which we don't find that Mother Yashoda prepares pizzas for Krishna. So it's it's a different it's a different angle of approach. One angle of approach is that let me do let me act within the Krishna conscious principles according to the way I like to do some allowance what I like to do. And the other approach is let me offer to Krishna what he likes to do. And of course there may be some adjustment also for health reasons. Even for preaching, you see, in Hong Kong, now it's all China, they were preaching and 
Chinese people, if you give them Indian style prasad or even Western style prasad, then they don't like it. They're very, very strongly in that culture. So then they used to give them Chinese style prasad. And Krishna doesn't eat that, but he might do just to, because Gornitai might eat it because they're in the preaching mood. So some adjustment can be made, but the Hari Sevanu Kulyaiva, that should be the is it favorable for Hari Seva, for pleasing the Lord, that should be the uh, standard of understanding. If we actually want to please the Lord, then we should know that this original culture which we may call Indian culture, or Vedic culture, or Vaishnava culture, or Hindu culture, and all these terms are not completely uh, interchangeable, but they're very much related. So that is the culture that Krishna, who is the Supreme Lord, and the Supreme Enjoyer, and the Supreme Autocrat, and who can literally do whatever he likes, that is the culture that he prefers. That's the culture that he lives in. Uh, and that culture, as much as we adopt it in our lives, that's also favorable for our spiritual advancement. The Vedic culture is favorable for spiritual cultivation, and it is the, it is the culture that one enters into and lives in, in the stage of spiritual perfection. The, the, we can understand this, it's not that... As, that as people sometimes think this is an Indian religion because that's that term Indian religion that in itself is an oxymoron or a contradictory term because religion is concerned with the soul not with any geographical area but we can say this is Indian in as much as we understand from Shastra from Srimad Bhagavatam and other Shastras that within this whole universe, the area which is nowadays politically known as India, Bharat Varsha, that area is particularly meant for spiritual cultivation and advancement. And the culture that has traditionally been practiced there is basically that which is meant for spiritual advancement, although, especially in the Kali Yoga, there have been many uh, adjustments, many of them which are not very directly spiritual and most, or a lot of what goes on in the name of Hinduism today is really very, very bogus and not at all favorable for actual spiritual advancement. There's so much nonsense and cheating going on in my name of Hinduism, but still the, the basic original culture is based on the ordinances of the Vedic literatures, which are meant for spiritual advancement culminating in Krishna consciousness. Or very simply put, as much as we adopt this culture, uh, that will help us to advance in Krishna consciousness. It's not that simply by wearing a dhoti or sari one becomes Krishna conscious. You have to do a lot more than that. You have to chant the holy name and dedicate our lives to Krishna. But generally we see that someone who, along with their Krishna conscious practices, they like to dress like this. And generally we can understand that they're, they're very serious about identifying themselves with Krishna and with Krishna consciousness. Uh, they, they don't have, it means they, they don't feel fear about dressing like that. They're, they're happy to show that yes, my identity is with Krishna and his devotees. So that in itself is a statement. How a person dresses that says something about them, doesn't it? If you see a person in a suit and tie, you can understand, oh, he's probably a businessman or a politician or someone who's so-called respectable in the established society. And if you see someone, they're just wearing some shorts, you can understand they're just in a very casual mood. Uh, so if a devotee is dressed in dhoti or sari, 
And people can tila and people can immediately understand, oh, Krishna devotee, that's preaching in itself. Rupa Prabhu's wife was telling me that she has a habit of going everywhere in the sari. She doesn't wear any other dress. And uh, people recognize and they like that. And I think maybe the ladies like it more. The Croatian uh, women folk. Because generally, as, as Prabhupada himself said, you may think, why am I as a sannyasi saying this? But I'm quoting Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, the sari is the most feminine dress. So, uh, ladies, they can appreciate it. Oh, it's a very nice dress. It's, uh, especially silk and so nice designs. And it, it looks very elegant. So that in itself is a statement of culture. It's a, immediately, if, if, a, if a woman is wearing a sari, then you can immediately see this is so much more cultured than a woman wearing some some shorts or something like that. It's, it just means no culture. Anyone can understand. It's, so uh, that also, dhoti, that's also a statement of Krishna consciousness. And when I was, I was first allowed to join this movement in the mid-1970s. So, we're, of course, we thought you and dhotis and harinam and this, and people used to laugh. They used to think it's somewhat effeminate because it looks something like a dress. But then shortly after that, all these kung fu movies came out. So, people think it's, you know, people think it's a, it's a very low-class civilization. They, they consider you know, a ma- a person, a man according to his ability to punch other people in the head, he's considered manly. So, uh, so then that became, it. So, oh, you must, they see us dressed like this and think, oh, he must be some kind of, some strong man or something like that. So that became accepted also. Anyway, accepted or not accepted, this is the dress of devotees, and by dressing uh, as a devotee, of course, you can be a devotee in suit and tie, as Prabhupada said. Although I never know, I never heard that Prabhupada said you can become a, de- a devotee. You can be a devotee in in uh, you know, mangy old pants and 25 year old jeans. And he said, Prabhupada said suit and tie. When he said that his, when Prabhupada gave permission to his disciples to distribute books in kami clothes, he said suit and tie and tila. Because he wanted to see that they're they look what is considered respectable according to modern society. So, uh, that if we dress like a devotee, then we, we feel more that helps us to feel like that. Just like a policeman, when he's dressed in his uniform, that helps him to feel like that. And yes, and others also feel yes. He's a policeman, and they, they interact with him on that basis. So dress is only, I, it's, I, I'm not, it, I am stressing this factor, but only to stress that actually we have a very, very broad culture, of which dress is one part, it's a very visible part, but a very, very broad culture of behavior, how people behave with each other, and how elders should be respected, and interactions between the sexes. It's not that uh, you see any in in any civilized culture, even in this country, in the Western world up until recently, it's not that any man can walk up to any woman he never knows and just start talking to them and laughing and joking with them. Or even if he knows them, it means that but you do. a man won't get to know very much a woman who's not only his wife, sister, mother like this. Even his, even he's living in the same house with his brother's wife. But even there's a lot of reserve in dealings because the whole Vedic culture is designed to protect against uh, fall down in, into uh, illicit sex, which spoils spiritual aspirations. So how we behave, how we raise up children. Nowadays there are many modern ideas. You, you just let them do. Let them do as they like. Let they, they can later they can choose what they like. But let them do what they like means you're saying 
You're not training them. They're supposed to be trained. The duty as the parents is to train the children as to what is right and what is wrong. But in modern society, they, they, they're not much concerned with what is right and what is wrong. It's just that whatever you feel like, do it. Dog philosophy. That's the dog. That's his level of consciousness. Whatever he feels like, he does. Unless someone beats him with a stick. But uh, he has no power to discriminate what is right and what is wrong. So he just, as much as he do, as much as he likes, does what he likes. His only uh, motivation is how to satisfy his senses. He has no idea of right, wrong, duty, responsibility, no sir, or consideration for others. There are none of these things exist in a dog's mentality. The dog is simply interested in how he can enjoy himself. That's all. His senses. So, uh, modern society, that's, it's, the, the, because they, again, coming from Darwin's theory, then there's no absolute principle. Everything is simply a combination of chemicals. So, you do as you like. What does it matter? There's still there are laws in society to, that you just do as you like means you just can't walk up to someone and shoot them. There's some controls. You can or even punch them in the face. There are some controls, but they make it as liberal as possible so everyone can enjoy themselves as much as possible. So this sounds like a... it's good, isn't it? it sounds very good. I, I, some time ago I read a statement by uh, an American student who, who said that modern America is the, the highest culmination of human culture. Because it allows every participant in this culture the greatest opportunity to pursue personal happiness. That was his understanding. Which is true, it gives the, everyone the greatest opportunity to develop personal sense gratification, which they equate with happiness. But that's not actually very advanced, because, like I said, dogs and cats, their whole life is only meant for sense gratification. Rather, the highest culture is that which is based on spiritual elevation, the substratum of which is the Varnashram system, in which there's so, so much duty, responsibility, based on the understanding that we are ultimately spiritual beings. We have a duty to God. There is sin. There is there's pious activity, there are pious activities, and there are sinful activities. Certain things are sinful. You have to suffer, you get a sinful reaction from that. Or pious activities, you get some benefit. And beyond punya and pa, pious and sinful, there are spiritual activities, those which are uh, directly meant for satisfying the Supreme Lord in Bhakti Yoga. So it's a, a completely different, completely different culture, completely different outlook. That's completely different. This was demonstrated to me as I entered the hall. The, the kirtan is going on, which is meant for the pleasure of Krishna. And you walk in the hall and you see the beer tap, which is meant for the pleasure of the senses. So the two things are, are just symbolic of the two different cultures. One which is based on haritoshanam, samsidhya haritoshanam, on the understanding that the perfection of life is to satisfy Vishnu. And the uh, other culture is uh, that Indriya Toshana, satisfy the senses. A completely different outlook. Devotees have to understand this. If we think that modern Western life, well, it's okay, we can, if we make modern Western life the template, you understand that word template? If we make that the template and try to put Krishna consciousness on top, it's not going to work. It's not going to work properly, just like any of you know about computers, this Bill Gates built his windows up on, a, on the basis of DOS, and it doesn't really work. It always crashes, because it's, the DOS is insufficient to support the more complex Windows system. So, 
it doesn't it doesn't actually work because one that the Western civilization or the modern sense gratificatory demoniac civilization is meant for one purpose. And Krishna is, and that purpose is not Krishna conscious. So that if you try to adopt the modern way of life and then add Krishna consciousness, it does, of course Prabhupada said that you can add Krishna consciousness, but actually that's, that's something we say just to bring people in. But actually if we're going to take up Krishna consciousness, then we have to reject the values of modern Western life, because they are opposed. The values of modern Western life are simply demoniac, and those of Krishna consciousness are simply sublime. So the two don't go on together. Of course, we're living in the Western world, and to some extent, we have to live according to its rules and its norms. But actually, a devotee he should not identify with this society at all. Robert once said that. We can judge our advancement if we're walking on the street and we feel, I don't belong. I know I'm not part of this. I have a different identity. We don't identify ourselves with all this sense gratificatory society. We identify ourselves with Krishna. So that is one sign of advancement that we've understood. I don't belong to all this. I did this nationalism or, or it's just, I, even I've seen sometimes devotees, I saw once, I came into Mayapur at the festival time. This is the time when America had decided in the name of justice, liberty, truth, etc. to bomb Iraq to pieces. So the, Iraq had invaded Kuwait. So I arrived in Mayapur and I saw one American devotee proclaiming to others that we smashed them. Who? What? You're here in the holy town? I, as a servant of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and thinking, thinking himself as an American, that we smashed them. What is this? This is not, nothing to do with you. What, didn't he read Bhagavad Gita as it is? What's that tilak on your nose? What's, you know, the two things don't go together if we identify my country, our people, we should, we, we drove out the serfs. We, 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 what? What have we got to do? This, we have nothing to do with this. I heard also sometimes the, in the one devotee from South America long ago who was telling me that when the World Cup soccer is on, all the devotees are there watching cheering on their team. So, means they didn't really understand Krishna consciousness. If we identify that our team is in the World Cup, our, our, well, well, but the, the first understanding of Krishna consciousness is that we don't belong here. We don't belong in Croatia. We don't belong in this material world. We belong in the spiritual world. That's why we have to live as devotees, act as devotees, think as devotees, identify with Krishna's family. We belong in the family of the Vrajvasi, the Vrajvasi family, the, the spiritual world with Krishna. We don't belong in this material world. So that we have to think like that, act like that adopt the Krishna conscious way of life. Partially, it's not going to work. When Krishna says, Savadhaman Puritya Ma Mekam Sharanam Raja, he really means it. He's right, he's God. But we have to surrender to him, giving up all other things. Of course, we may not be ready to do so immediately, therefore we have the process of Bhakti Yoga. But how can that Bhakti Yoga process be successful? Tivrena Bhakti Yoga Nayajita Purushankara By very seriously performing devotion service, we can be successful in devotional life. Now, bringing people to devotional life, there may be various means and adjustments, and we ourselves have to make some adjustments to live in this Western world, just like as I was saying, Prabhupada, he wore a dhoti in the West, but then in the cold, 
winter of New York, Prabhupada woke up one morning and saw that everything was white. He thought someone had whitewashed everything in the night. He'd never seen snow. So Prabhupada used to wear a, a big heavy coat also over his sannyas cloth. So like that, there may be some adjustment. Prabhupada even, although he said he didn't like leather, sometimes he told the bodies, you don't wear leather shoes. There are other occasions he said they could do if they had to go out on book distribution in the cold winter. There's nothing as warm as leather. So Prabhupada allowed. If you need to do it to distribute books, you can. So Prabhupada made some allowances. But again, we have to see what is the dividing line between an allowance and a compromise. And better that we gravitate towards the pure Vedic culture as much as possible, which will help us to remember Krishna and to identify with Krishna and Krishna consciousness. That means quite a different way of life to that of the average European. For instance, as I often say, and usually when I say, for some reason or other, which I'm not really sure why, devotees laugh, when I say that if you want to be Krishna conscious, if you actually want, then one thing you have to do is, if you have a TV in your home, remove it. You see, so I laugh, I have to laugh, because I think it's a joke. I don't know why, it's a very serious thing. If the TV is pumping out constantly all kinds of the lowest debased, degraded ideas, simply pumping into your home and into your consciousness. Calm, cold, low. What does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? Trividam narakasya dam dwaram nashana vatmanaha kavas krodas tata lobas tasmat etatrayam chidet Krishna says that there are three gates leading to hell, lust, greed and anger. Therefore an intelligent person should give them up. But what is the TV promoting? Lust, sex, 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 sex. Anger, violence, violence, violence. And greed, advertisements, advertisements, advertisements. Buy this, buy that. So it's really a very, very low consciousness comes out of the TV. What, what is that? Some stupid dramas and movies and cartoons. I mean, how stupid can you get? Cartoons and sports and they're all simply increasing illusion. But sometimes people say that religion is a psychological crutch, but actually TV is like a psychological crutch. That people, they, you know, they... Wait a minute, that's when I was a kid, you used to go like that. And nowadays it's like that. Isn't it? So it's just, you know, you, you, know, if you turn it on, then you see, you don't think. You turn off any any thinking of any sort, just turn it off and then mm. absorb all this garbage into your consciousness. So TV is like a psychological crutch. People, they just go and sit there. They, they, it's, it's like a kind of intoxication. They just forget. And time goes by as they watch this. So it's, it's very... Uh, if it was only a waste of time, it wouldn't be so bad. A waste of time is bad enough. But it, not only does it waste our time that we could be engaging in Krishna consciousness, but it spoils our consciousness. So all the, a devotee, is, is, if he's actually going to be serious about understanding Krishna, really has to make a decision to lead a very different way of life. Even though externally it may be that due to economic circumstances, one has to work and have a job and all this kind of thing. Although even that, Prabhupada was so serious, he said it's better that Krihastas, they don't live in the city, get out, and grow your own food and get away from this demoniac civilization, live in the country, depend on the land. But mostly people don't want to, uh, to their own uh, disadvantage. But even if you insist you have to live in the city, and then don't, don't adopt this demoniac way of life. Watching TV, going to cinema, sports, it all it will simply result in repeated birth and death. It's not that we can have a 
half maya and half Krishna consciousness. Well, that's not Krishna consciousness. You can have, you can have, but that hearing and chanting about Krishna, what will that result in? The Chaitanya Charitamrita has stated that one can go on hearing and chanting about Krishna for many, many lifetimes and not attain Krishna consciousness, not attain love of Krishna, if one is making offenses. So one has to be actually very, very serious about being Krishna conscious. Take a decision that my life is meant for understanding Krishna. I should do whatever is required for that. Even if it's different, that's the whole thing. Culture shapes the way people act. So every, everyone, although there may be individual differences, a culture is tends to be somewhat homogenous. Everyone acts in a more or less the same way, they have the same values, and the culture shapes the way that people think. So taking up Krishna consciousness actually means to think in a different way, to have different values. And so we, uh, devotees, they shouldn't adopt the way of the life or, or continue to have the same way of life as the demons, because then you can't be Krishna conscious. Duryodhana and Yudhishthira are different. They're similar. They're both kings, they're both from a royal dynasty, they both know how to fight, they both know how to administer the state, but they're different. What is the difference? Duryodhana is against Krishna consciousness and Yudhishthira is for Krishna consciousness. So although there may be many similarities, there's a difference of consciousness, difference of outlook. Uh, maybe if Yudhishthira had been in the same wicked consciousness as Duryodhana, he would have accepted him, although demons tend to fight among themselves. Certainly if Duryodhana had adopted the way of thinking of Yudhishthira, Yudhishthira Maharaj would have accepted him. He was a devotee, he was broad-minded and liberal. Even though Duryodhana wasn't ready to give the, the Pandavas even one pinpoint of ground, if Yudhishthira had been in the same position, he would have gladly given Duryodhana half the kingdom or even most of it, because he's a devotee. If Duryodhana had been Krishna conscious, so, uh, devotee and uh, demons, they both live in this world. They all have the same physical needs. Ahara, Nidra, Bhaya, Eating, sleeping, mating and defending, these are basic human needs. But those who are of uh, non-elevated consciousness, they can't see beyond this. Only eating, sleeping, mating and defending. Whereas a devotee, for him, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, that's something that, that's just something that has to be done. But his real interest of life is how to act for the pleasure of Krishna. So a devotee's life, it's, it's just like Prabhupada explained about his father. That his father used to go to the, uh, his shop twice a day. His father owned a cloth shop. But he, Prabhupada said his real life his real interest in life was doing puja. He did puja three times a day. And he'd be, for a long period, every day, he would be ding, 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 ring his bell, reciting mantras. That was his real interest in life. He would go to the shop, come back, eat, take a little rest, and then most of his day was doing puja. And he did his shop to maintain his family, but he wasn't, he wasn't interested in becoming a big businessman and opening another shop and a new showroom in a different part of the city and expanding his business more and more. Whatever. Some income is there? All right. It's enough to support the family and let my puja go on. So like that, a devotee's life, he should try to organize his life in such a way that his means of income doesn't take all his time and life. Whatever, do something, earn something, but our day's activity, that should be worshipping the Lord, studying Shastra, chanting the holy names, associating with devotees, preaching Krishna consciousness. This is the life of a devotee. A devotee is such a high culture and philosophy. Then again to go down to that lowest of the low, so-called subhuman culture, to imitate the way of life of the karmis. That's not not at all proper. For one who has got this knowledge should take this and act on this. 
come to the highest standard. Krishna spoke, Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna, to bring him to the highest standard. Now you have this knowledge. How can you act like a low class, base person? A devotee should always cultivate this knowledge with great faith in Krishna, great hope that certainly uh, Krishna will deliver me. And uh, if, if we're actually absorbing this knowledge of Krishna consciousness, experiencing the pleasure of chanting the holy names, we can't be attracted to all these useless things. You know, TV, sports, fashions, politics, all oh, useless. Let us hear about Krishna. Let us use this wonderful opportunity that we have been given by Prabhupada, all the uh, great Acharyas have given us this opportunity to utilize our human form of life in hearing and chanting about Krishna, serving Krishna, associating with and serving his food. Let us utilize this opportunity and take it up fully and uh, as much as possible take up the way of life that is conducive to becoming Krishna conscious and not be enamored by this Although this, this culture that we're living in is very strong in as much as it's everywhere. But we can shut it out of our lives. We, no one's forcing us to keep a TV in our home to turn it on. No one's forcing us to take an interest in all these useless things. So let us develop, let us lead a way of life that will help us to more and more develop a sense of Krishna consciousness. Hare Krishna. So we're Short of time here, I'll finish there. Hare Krishna. I guess I could take one or two questions. Is it all right? Do you have time for that? Or who's to say? No one said no, so. Okay. Um, actually, I have to go to the bathroom. Why don't you announce these books in the meantime? Or Radha Govinda Prabhu, you consider yourself a better announcer? You can do Anyway, you're native Croatian, so if you want to announce in Croatian, you can do so. If anyone has any question, please ask. The question is that Prabhupada saw good things even in drunken men. So why is it that we see we find it difficult to find good things even in devotees? You find it difficult to find good things in devotees? Are you complaining about me? I'm, I'm complaining about all the devotees. Well, that's a question of development of consciousness. Prabhupada used to quote that, that the fly always looks for the sores, the open wounds, whereas a bee looks for the pollen, nectar, nectarian pollen in the flower. So, that consciousness has to be developed that one can see the good even in bad, but at the same time, that consciousness should not simply be one of uh, indiscriminately considering everything to be nice. Discrimination is very much required. That we, that we can understand what is proper, what is improper, what is what right and what is wrong according to the directions of Shastra. It's not that because Prabhupada could see some good in some drunkards that, that he thought that drunkenness is good. As a distinction. Generally, not generally, in, in all cases, drunkenness is not good. But the point is that even a drunkard, if he does something good, that may be recognized. It's not that we say that drunkenness is good. It's not at all good. And any other? Yeah, yes. Some moment, uh, they hear the argument that 
Did you hear that? No. Sometimes it's said that we have to accept, it's better that we accept some of the values of Western society. It, Prabhupada was so saying that, criticizing Prabhupada, that he was so strict that, that our movement is not well accepted in Western society. Well, Prabhupada called the Western society, he referred to it as nasty Western civilization and many other such terms, a dog-cat civilization. What is this, he used to say, what is this topless, bottomless civilization, referring to certain bars that you can go to where the, the bar maids are topless and bottomless. So he said some other things which are so strong that you, you, you can't say openly, actually. You, you shouldn't say it openly, they're so strong. I mean, they're really very, very strong. And, now people people get offended if you say I can say privately afterwards if you okay. Prabhupada actually said to say these things publicly, but but I don't I don't think anyone ever has done. So even I'm not saying it. So uh, actually Prabhupada his his method was in like a needle, out like a plow. So, ultimately he wanted to show that actually these statements, this, you know, probably he's making some very strong statements when, when the whole movement was challenged. I think, it must be in 1976, a court case came up in New York and the Hare Krishna was his brainwashing. So then Prabhupada, instead of trying to adjust and say, no, 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 actually we're very nice, Prabhupada, he said, how you should speak in court? And say, yes, you are brainwashing. Your brain is unclean. It requires to be washed. Actually, you have no brain. We are brain giving. <laughs> said your brain is full of stool. It requires to be washed. So Prabhupada, was, uh, Prabhupada wasn't so much anxious to be accepted by the Western society on its own terms because he considered the, the terms of the Western civilization to be demoniac. Prabhupada wanted that this moon be accepted, but not on the terms of the demons, but on our own terms. When Prabhupada was asked about public relations, he said that public relations means not that we adjust ourselves to the public, but we adjust the public to accept what we are doing, because what we are doing is you wrong. Know? So, our criterion is not public acceptance. If it's there, all well and good, but not on their terms. Sometimes people say, well, we should become more normal, and people will accept us, and I become you know, normal, we watch TV, we eat, we drink, and we smoke, and we become, and you'll be accepted by the others as you go to hell with them. But then where is the Krishna consciousness? Krishna consciousness means to act according to the pleasure of Krishna. Not that we dance according to the tune of the public, who are all fools. If you don't know Krishna, then the whole way of life is foolish. So, it's very dangerous actually this idea that we should adjust ourselves to the modern way of life. Rather, we should adjust them to our way of life. But then we have to act our way of life, otherwise what are we going to adjust them to? And if we become adjusted to that way of life, then, then, you lose, then you're not Krishna conscious, because that way of life is not Krishna conscious. There is a difference, it's not all the same. Any other question? It may be difficult, you see, if you're, if you're a householder living in ordinary society among ordinary people, it, it may be difficult to all the time be in opposition to modern society, but that's the price of being in a preaching movement. There, you see, there are so many... Christianity, how was that founded? The Christians, the early Christians, they didn't adjust themselves to the Romans. They went to the to the uh, arena with the lions eating them. They wouldn't adjust. 
We're going to be Christians. You're in power, you don't like it, okay, we'll go to the lions. But we have our principles, we will stick with them. On that basis, Christianity. Because the, the people had the strength of conviction. They were prepared to die for their belief, and therefore it spread. But if we're not even prepared to get up watching TV, then uh, where is the question of Christian consciousness spread on? Did you hear and translate? No. Did everyone else hear the question? The question or the uh, comment is that if we're living in a hmm, yeah, if we're living in a temple, uh, uh, then it's easier to be different. But if we're living in the broader society, I mentioned that also in the class. Uh, uh, I actually discussed this point in the class. If you're living in broader society, it's difficult to uh, be so different. Well, as I was saying, Prabhupada actually wanted devotees to develop their own communities, land-based communities, and live separately from that of what we may call normal people, although it seems like a big zoo to me. That we, to create our own macrocosmic communities that we can live in. That's how America was founded. The, uh, the Pilgrim Fathers, they sailed from England and they, uh, because they wanted to go somewhere where they could live according to their own beliefs. There was, there was one brand of Christians who, one group of Christians who weren't accepted by the mainstream Christians in England at that time. So they all, several thousands of them, they all got in ships and went off to America and where we, where we can live according to our own principles. And that's, America was developed by the Pilgrim Fathers and called like that. So we, it's better that devotees, it, it, it's asking for major adjustments in people's lives that you can move to a place where you can associate with devotees, or at least if we're living in the cities, we should regularly associate with devotees. If we can't immediately make such a big adjustment, then we should associate with devotees. And associate means, of course, some social interaction will be there, but the, the, the basis of our association should be hearing and chanting about Krishna. Not that we simply get together and, oh, hi, Ball, how are you, and tell a few jokes and go away. That's not association with devotees. This should be very, very strongly based on Krishna consciousness. And we can take those examples and give examples of Christians in the past who they, who they really had conviction and they, they went against the whole way of life of the society, the broader society they were in because they had that much conviction that, that we want this, we want to follow this way, we have to follow this way, that this means so much to us, that this is more important to us than life itself. They weren't, uh, for them, uh, their Christianity wasn't a hobby. So in the same way with Christian consciousness, if we understand how important it is, then definitely we're going to want to base our lives around it, rather than, than trying to squeeze Krishna consciousness into the present way of life we have. Rather, we'll have to consider how to live our lives in a way that is conducive to Krishna consciousness. It may require some major adjustments. Now, it may not be that everyone, when they first come to Krishna consciousness, we, we say that you have to make such a major adjustment. That, uh, but even from the beginning, if anyone's getting serious, you have to tell them, look, these are the four regulated principles. And, and naturally, actually, if someone's coming into Krishna consciousness, they'll understand that what's the, if they actually grasp the essence, then naturally they won't be interested. 
Why should they be interested in silly sense gratificatory activities like watching TV and following sports and fashions? If you're attracted to this philosophy of Krishna consciousness, then you're not going to be interested in such things. Maybe after some time devotees they become complacent and they think, oh, well, let's go back to that. That means they didn't really get the taste of Krishna consciousness. We have to practice Krishna consciousness very seriously. Then we'll get a taste for it. Otherwise, if we go back to that rotten taste of the material world, that means we didn't really grasp Krishna consciousness. So we'll finish there. Time's up. Is there anyone more question? No. Okay. And we'll finish. Hare right, Krishna. And tomorrow evening also. <laughs> Actually, that's also not Vedic. If you like, you can say sadhu, sadhu. That is another Western innovation. <laughs> Alright, the books are announced. I'll announce again. I don't, call, I don't have any new books since I was last here, but. Um, oh, actually, this Jai Srila Prabhupada is reprinted after a long time. So I request you to take some of my books. I can quite openly and unabashedly say that these books will help you advance in spiritual life. They are important books which are good for you. So please take them. Hare Krishna.